Okay, colleagues, uh, thank you for joining. Uh, I see colleagues are joining and perhaps we could should start. We can start. Today we are very pleased to have Professor Patrick Guggenberger of Penn State University presenting on the powerful Subvector Anderson Rubin test in linear instrumental variables regression with conditional fitness classicity. Thank you, Patrick. Um, Patrick, is it okay if we interrupt during the talk? Oh, uh, please. Yes, please. Um, so I'm it's, gonna... about, it's about an hour, but we can go longer, of course. Excellent. Thank you so much for, for having me. Thanks for the invitation. So, um, Rusam already mentioned the title here. It's joint work with Frank Leibergen, uh, University of Amsterdam, and Sophocles Mafroidis from the University of Oxford. This has been um, ongoing work for a very long time. So, maybe some of you have seen me or Sophocles or Frank present a paper a long time ago. But we are finally, uh, I think, finishing it up. And that's probably the last time I'm, I'm, I'm going to present it. All right. Uh, so, what is uh, the um, objective here? Uh, we are in the context of the linear instrumental variables model, and we are trying to do inference on just one or uh, on a subvector of all the slope coefficients. So many times for applied researchers, they are interested in just one slope coefficient in the presence of additional slope coefficients. And this may be challenging in, in situations where we have weak identification, where the instrumental variables are only weakly correlated with the endogenous regressors. Um, in that case, we know that standard inference procedures like a wall test or a likelihood ratio test are size distorted. And uh, it is challenging to come up with inference procedures that control the size. So here we are interested in robust, powerful, computationally fast inference on a slope coefficient or on a sub vector of, the, uh, of all the slope coefficients. And I wanna go through all these uh, uh, bold face uh, um, items here. To, to, to explain in more detail what I mean by that. Okay, so by robust, I mean that we wanna control the null rejection probability of the hypothesis test uniformly over all the empirically relevant parameter constellations. Now, what do I, what do I mean by empirically relevant? In particular, I mean that we do not want to exclude through assumptions, the presence of weak instruments. So again, weak instruments is, is a situation where we find IVs that satisfy the exogeneity condition, but they are only weakly correlated with the endogenous regressors. And it seems that this is quite a pervasive situation in applied research because it is notoriously difficult to find instrumental variables that are at the same time um, exogenous, that is uncorrelated with the error term and strongly correlated with the endogenous regressors. The workhorse example, I guess, that triggered this uh, literature on weak instruments is the paper by Engels Krüger 91. They're looking at a wage regression and they're interested in um, uh, assessing the impact of years of education on, on uh, expected wage. So here we uh, are concerned about unobservability that would be part of the error term. And one would need to find an IV that is uncorrelated with uh, ability, but correlated with years of education. And you can play around in your mind with, with uh, variables that are supposed to satisfy these two requirements, and it becomes very, very tricky. So what Engels and Krueger uh, um, propose in their 91 paper is quarter of birth of the worker, which sounds at first like a very weird concept, but it has to do with very particular schooling laws in the United States. And it turns out that there is correlation or non-zero correlation uh, between quarter of birth and years of education, but it only occurs through the subset of high school dropouts. So it is an IV, okay? Uh, one can make a case that it's uh, an exogenous variable, but the correlation with, the, with years of education is very, very small because it only happens through a very small subset, namely of the high school dropouts. So we, we don't wanna exclude the possibility of weak instruments in our parameter space. As I already mentioned, in the presence of IVs, inference becomes much harder to find tests that control the size or the asymptotic size. We know that uh, weak instruments have, have an adverse effect on inference and estimation. And there's a long literature now that dates back to at least uh, Phillips 89. 
Um, we know that classical tests over reject the true null hypothesis. For example, Dufour shows that uh, if you don't impose any restrictions on the weakness of the IVs, then a walled test in a finite sample context can have null rejection probability arbitrarily close to one for any nominal size that you implement the test. So over rejection becomes severe. And at the same time, if you use the test um, by inversion to construct confidence intervals or confidence regions, the uh, flip side of that is that the coverage probability of that uh, confidence interval could be as close to zero um, as you like. Okay, so we don't wanna exclude weak instruments from our parameter space. Secondly, we um, don't wanna impose a restriction as strong as conditional homoscedasticity. So we have looked at the same problem previously in a, in a paper published in, uh, in QE in 2019. That's a paper that I will refer to as uh, GKM from now on. In that work, we assumed conditional homoscedasticity and proposed subvector inference procedures. Um, here, the, the incremental contribution of this paper is that we want to drop the assumption of conditional homoscedasticity. And we'll do that in two steps. First, we will introduce a, an inference procedure that works under so-called Kronecker product structure for a certain variance covariance matrix. I'll explain later exactly what that is. It just means that the variance covariance matrix factors in a certain product of two matrices. Um, and then with this intermediate step, finally, we'll, we'll drop the, um, any restriction on the variance matrix from our parameter space and we allow for arbitrary forms of conditional heteroscedasticity. Okay, so the, the two main items that we don't wanna uh, impose restrictions on is weak instruments and um, any restriction on the variance covariance matrix in terms of homoscedasticity. Um, second bullet point was, uh, is about power. So conditional on the test controlling size, we, we want it to have good overall power properties. So let me say, uh, talk a little bit about the history of, um, so we, we are using the, uh, a version of the Anderson-Rubin test, subvector test as our test statistic. Let me talk a little bit about the history of critical values. So how they became smaller and smaller and thereby uh, the, the power of the test became bigger and bigger. So the subvector Anderson Rubin test has been suggested for a long time to be used um, as a uh, test statistic when testing subvector hypothesis. And in particular, uh, in a 2005 econometrica paper, Dufour and Tamuti suggested just using the uh, projection of the full vector Anderson Rubin test, that is the subvector Anderson Rubin test, together with the critical values that you would use for full vector hypothesis testing, that is chi squared critical values with k degrees of freedom, or k is the number of IVs. Then we had a paper uh, in 2012 in Econometrica where we showed that there is a Pareto improvement. You can actually use, you, get a, you can get away with using chi-squared critical values with k minus mw degrees of freedom, where mw is the dimension of the structural parameter vector uh, that is not the part of the structural parameter vector that is not under test, and you still control the asymptotic size. So rather than using those critical values that were suggested in Diffu and Tamuti, you can uh, get away with smaller critical values and still control the asymptotic size. Interestingly, the worst case in terms of where the largest or when the largest quantiles of the test statistic occur is under strong identification. Okay, so under weak identification, it turns out that the uh, quantiles of the test statistic are actually smaller, which suggests that if we knew the degree of uh, the strength or weakness of identification, we could get away with even smaller critical values, some sort of data dependent critical values that adjust to the strength or weakness of identification. So this is what we did in the 2019 paper. Uh, we considered data dependent critical values that adapt to the strength of identification. And when it turns out that the that identification is strong, then the critical values revert to the chi-squared critical values. But otherwise, when identification is rather weak, the, the critical values become smaller. The challenge, of course, is to implement it in a way um, such that the overall size of the test is not uh, affected by, by that initial step where you check how strong the uh, degree of identification is. So in this uh, 2019 paper, we show then that um, the, the method in JK, JKMC, our 2012 paper, 
was inadmissible. There is another test, namely our 2019 procedure, that has uniformly um, non-smaller power and sometimes strictly bigger power. Okay, so uh, now what are we doing in the, in the case where we don't have the assumption of conditional homoscedasticity? As I mentioned, first we um, in, introduce a version of the subfactor in this Rubin test that works under chronicler product structure, which is a weaker assumption than conditional homoscedasticity, but it nests conditional homoscedasticity. Um, when we when we don't have any assumption on the on the structure of the variance covariance matrix, we um, look at a two stage method where in the first stage we pretest um, whether the data is compatible with chronicler product structure. And if the data is deemed to be compatible, we use our new uh, KPS and the Rubin subfactor test. Otherwise, when the data is not compatible with chronicler product structure or found by the pretest to be not compatible, we use a fully robust, fully robust meaning robust to conditional heteroskedasticity, Anderson Rubin, Anderson Rubin type test introduced recently by, by Don Andrews. Okay, what, what is the benefit? I, I mean, there are tests already that satisfy what we are after. They're introduced in, in more general contexts, even in GMM contexts, but our procedure is more powerful in the linear IV context and also computationally simpler to implement. Okay, um, an additional main contribution, I already alluded to that, is computational ease. In the case where it is found that um, the, data is the data are compatible with a, co a chronic product structure, our test is uh, very easy to implement. Okay, the test statistic is given in closed form and also the critical value is given in closed form. Um, only if the data are found to be not compatible and we have to resort to this fully robust procedure by end of 2017, the computational burden becomes more restrictive. Um, there is a large literature on robust inference for the full parameter vector. Okay, probably most of you have, have seen papers by Kleiberg in 2002, um, conditional likelihood ratio test by Moraira. But as I mentioned already, it, uh, the um, the move from full vector inference to subvector inference is challenging because now you have additional nuisance parameters under the null, namely the structural parameters um, that are not under test. And this is a very relevant topic, as I mentioned already. Many times you have uh, several endogenous regressors, but you are only interested in doing inference on the slope coefficient of one. Or also you could have a setup where you are interested in the slope coefficient of an exogenous regressor in the presence of other um, endogenous regressors. So besides the example from labor economics that I already discussed um, by Angus Kruger 91, wage regressions, uh, you can also think of a new Keynesian Phillips curve. So that would be an example from macroeconomics where you have um, several endogenous regressors on the, on the right-hand side, right? You have uh, inflation expectations and output gap or labor share, and you are interested maybe only in the coefficient in, in one of the slope coefficients. Um, there is a closely related project, uh, another paper with uh, Frank and, and uh, Sophocles that actually now was accepted in Journal of Econometrics, where we suggest an uh, uh, a actual hypothesis test um, for chronic product structure. I'll come back to that paper later on if I have time. All right, so here is um, the outline of the presentation today. That what, what I did so far was the introduction and the motivation, I hope. I first will have to review our QE paper, the 2019 paper. I'll talk about uh, the finite sample case first, that is the most restrictive case where we impose very, very strong assumptions. And uh, further uh, restriction at first will be that I consider the case where there's one um, nuisance parameter, one additional nuisance parameter, that is we have a slope coefficient, uh, sorry, we have a structural parameter vector, um, where we test a subvector hypothesis and only one of the structural parameters is not pinned down by the null hypothesis. Okay, so that, that is what MW equal to one means. So in that context, then I can really give the motivation of the new subvector test, discuss the uh, correct size, how it is obtained, um, and uh, uh, discuss the uniform power improvement our, over our earlier work, the 2012 paper. Then I move on to the more general case where MW is any, any uh, finite number. Again, proof correct size, uh, uniform power improvements, 
Then I move on to the asymptotic case where we drop the very strong um, setup, uh, the, strongest, uh, the strong assumptions imposed in the finite sample case. Um, that will first be a setup uh, where we impose conditional homoscedasticity. So all this is review from older papers. Then we move on um, to this project where we relax the assumption of conditional homoscedasticity, introduce this general chronic product structure. And finally, we discuss the general case, that is the case where we drop any restriction on the variance covariance matrix, and in particular allow for arbitrary forms of conditional heteroscedasticity. All right, so let's start with the finite sample setup, the most restrictive setup in terms of assumptions. So we have a structural equation. So here, Y could be uh, wage in the angry Kruger example. Uh, y, capital Y here could be years of education and W would be other um, control variables such as race, gender, uh, years of experience and so on and so forth. And we are interested in testing a hypothesis on beta alone in the presence of nuisance parameters, namely this parameter vector gamma. Um, here's the, the null hypothesis. Okay, so we are testing beta equal to beta naught versus a two-sided alternative. Then we have reduced form equations on um, uh, Y and W. So Y, as I mentioned already, could include endogenous or exogenous regressors. So it could be that Y is actually race, and you are interested in, uh, in the effect of race on, on wage in the presence of uh, endogenous regressors. So here in, in that example, then W would contain years of education and, and years of experience, for example. So we have these two reduced form equations that we can, we can write the whole system as a reduced form, right? By replacing the Y and the Ws by their reduced forms, we get a reduced form also for, for small uh, Y, where now this uh, uh, structural error term VY is a linear combination of the structural error term the and the two reduced form error terms d y and v w okay so we want to test that sub vector hypothesis uh, such that the size is bounded by the nominal size alpha and that overall we have good power properties okay so formally speaking here um, when uh, lambda indexes the the null distribution of the data we want that the supremum of the null rejection probability where we sub over all the, the DGPs in, in, our, um, in our parameter space is smaller than, than, than alpha. So here, at first, we impose very, very strong distributional assumptions on, on, on the data, but that is very common in the weak IV literature. And then as we move on, we relax this, these assumptions when we go to the, the asymptotic case. So at first, we assume that the um, um, IVs, the instrumental variables, are non-random; they are fixed, and we also impose a very uh, we we impose a strong distributional assumption on the reduced form errors. Remember that VI was defined previously here. Um, here, V um, collects all these um, reduced form errors, and by VI we just uh, talk about one of the the rows of that matrix here written as a column vector. So we impose that VI, the reduced form error, is IID normally distributed with a variance matrix um, um, omega. And we impose a further restriction, namely that a particular transformation of that variance covariance matrix is, is actually known to us. So we impose that the variance matrix of this particular um, vector here, so where, where does that come from and why is it relevant? is known to us. So what is um, y bar uh, zero i? That is uh, y i minus y i prime beta naught. So from the classical hypothesis tests, for example, the, the Wald test that tries to estimate the parameter vector of interest beta by let's say the, uh, an efficient GMM estimator, we know that this is problematic under weak IV because you can't consistently estimate the parameter vector of interest under weak identification. So what our procedure and other procedures previously in the literature do is rather than trying to estimate the uh, parameter vector of interest, we are evaluating, evaluating the test statistic at the hypothesized parameter vector. So we are plugging in, uh, we, we are re replacing the unknown beta 
by the hypothesized value in our test statistic. So this is where this uh, expression comes from. Yi minus Yi prime beta naught is going to arise in our test statistic. So the um, random variable Y bar zero I is going to be very important. And we impose that we know the variance covariance matrix of this uh, random vector together with the structural um, error term on uh, the W I. Okay, so we impose that this variance covariance matrix is known and positive definite. Also, that is a quite common assumption in the weak IV literature. Uh, Patrick, what is the set of all possible null distributions? So in this context, it's, it's very, very um, restrictive, right? We are assuming that Z is actually non-random. So it's just a set of numbers given to us. And the entire reduced form is normally distributed. OK, so the only parameters um, that are still left in, in our parameter space are the reduced form errors. Okay, these matrices here, not the reduced form errors, sorry, the uh, reduced form coefficient matrices, these pi matrices, okay, uh, and the gamma. So once you pin down these uh, matrices and, and, and this um, uh, reduced form uh, and, and this portion of the structural parameter vector, the entire DGP is pinned down. So, um, so importantly, to include the case of weak IV, we don't impose any restrictions on the pi matrices in, in our parameter space. All this will be completely relaxed as we move on. So as of now, as I said, the, the parameter space is very, very restrictive, right? We, we assume that this matrix is known, the um, variance covariance matrix of a particular transformation um, of, of, of uh, the, the data. Um, that we have normal, normal um, reduced form errors. Everything is very restrictive, but we're going to relax that when we move from the finite sample context to the um, 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 asymptotic context. Okay, so before I move on, um, let me quickly review the what people have been done for the full vector case. Okay, they are so full vector case means that the null hypothesis now also pins down uh, values for gamma. So in that context, uh, several robust methods have been introduced, some dating back uh, 70 years, the Anderson-Rubin test. And then given that the Anderson-Rubin test has relatively poor uh, power properties in over-identified uh, situations, the, a large literature was triggered in, in, in the early 2000s and uh, with many, many contributions. And we have some optimality uh, properties um, derived now. Um, for example, the paper by Andrews, Moraira, and Stock in Econometrica 2006 suggests that the conditional likelihood ratio test by Moraira should be used. Um, they first um, restrict the class of tests that can be used to uh, similar tests that satisfy certain invariance properties. Then they derive a two-sided um, um, power envelope, and they show that the power of the CLR test gets relatively close to, the, to this power envelope. Okay, there the, the have been some uh, additional insights uh, later on by Andrews, Marmer, and you uh, that, that show that the, the test doesn't really get that close to the power envelope. Um, but in an overall sense, um, I think it is agreed on in the literature that the CLR test by Moraira is the procedure to, to be used for, for full vector inference under certain restrictions. Uh, Shana Shukov, Hansen, and Jensen, they show that the uh, Anderson Rubin test even though it has rel relatively poor power properties in over-identified situations, uh, cannot be uniformly dominated. So it is actually an admissible test. Um, okay, so I'm gonna skip this. Um, so it is not a bad test to, to start off with when, when you look at sub-factor in inference, it is after all a, um, an, 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 an admissible test. So once you have a robust test for full vector inference, there are several things you can always do for subvector inference. So first of all, projection is one way where you just take the infimum of the full vector test statistic, where infimum means that you take the infimum of the test statistic over in our context gamma. Okay, so you you inf over the nuisance parameter, um, and then you combine the, this test statistic, the inf of the full vector test statistic, you combine it with the critical values you would use for full vector inference. This turns out to be in generally computationally hard, uh, 
to could be hard to find the infimum of the test statistic. And oftentimes it's also uh, very, very conservative, in particular when gamma in our context is of high, relatively high dimension. In our context, it turns out to be not computationally hard because the inf of the test statistic is just <clears throat> the test statistic evaluated at the, at the limal estimator. So it is actually given in closed form. Um, a second um, route to go rather than projecting is Bonferroni and related techniques, where rather than infing the test statistic over the entire parameter space, you first construct a confidence region in our context for gamma, and then you inf the test statistic only over this confidence region. So infing over a smaller set means that the test statistic uh, remains larger um, than in the projection projected version, which means that it could be a priori more powerful. But then unfortunately in the second stage, um, <clears throat> given that uh, sometimes you miss the true parameter vector when you construct a confidence region, you have to make a, an adjustment in the second stage and you can't implement uh, the, the test with the same critical value that you would use in projection, you have to use a uh, smaller nominal size. And then putting those two together, um, you have a larger critical, uh, you have a larger test statistic, but your, your critical value also got a little bit larger. It is not clear what the power ranking is between projection and Bonferroni. And of course, uh, we're talking about computational effort, it may even be harder because you have to find the info of the test statistic over a potentially weirdly shaped confidence region. Um, I should mention that subvector procedures have also been uh, looked at in more general context than the linear IV, right? I already mentioned Andrews 2017, but there has been a relatively long list of papers that derive subvector procedures in GMM context, so uh, nesting our linear IV model. Um, so those uh, contributions have the advantage that they are applicable in more general context, but when applied in the linear IV context, our incremental contribution is that in an overall sense, the, the power is, is um, um, more competitive and that also there is a computational advantage that our procedure is more easily implemented. There have even been contributions uh, uh, with regards to subvector inference in models defined by moment inequality. So that, that those would be even more general than subvector procedures in GMM contexts. All right. So just one slide, uh, because our procedure hinges uh, very strongly on the Anderson-Rubin test. Uh, how does the Anderson-Rubin test uh, work in, in the full vector context? So the Anderson-Rubin test statistic exploits the exogeneity assumption on the IVs, namely that the expectation of zi and epsilon i is equal to zero. The Anderson-Rubin test statistic is simply a, um, a quadratic form in the sample analog of this expectation. So if beta naught and gamma naught are the true, vec uh, tr true values of the structural parameter vector, then this portion here is just epsilon. So you, you can therefore see that the Anderson-Rubin test statistic is sim uh, simply a quadratic form with this weighting matrix in the sample average, um, in, in the sample analog of, of this expectation here. And under our very strong distributional assumptions, namely that um, the VIs, the reduced form errors, are normally distributed, the Anderson-Rubin test statistic is uh, distributed as chi-squared with k degrees of freedom, no matter what the strengths or weakness of identification. So it's a, a similar test. And comparing the test statistic to chi-squared critical values with one minus alpha degrees, uh, with k degrees of freedom, leads to a test that has null rejection probability equal to alpha. Okay, so we're gonna work with this test statistic. We're gonna use the projected version. So we simply inf this um, test statistic over gamma rather than evaluating it at, at, at a gamma naught because we don't have gamma naught for subvector hypothesis. We don't have a hypothesized um, value for, for, for gamma. So our uh, the, the test statistic that we're gonna work with, at least that's the test statistic we worked with in our 2019 paper is simply infing the full vector Anderson-Rubin statistic over gamma. Okay, so here uh, I used this simplified notation again, um, gamma not bar, that's simply y minus y beta not, and it appears in, in our test statistic here. So it turns out that 
it is much, much better to work with an alternative representation of uh, this representation of the Anderson Rubin subfactor statistic. Um, it can be expressed also as the smallest root of a certain characteristic polynomial. So simply uh, exploiting the fact that the minimal eigenvalue of a matrix A can be expressed in this particular form, you can go from this representation of the Anderson-Rubin statistic to this representation of the subfactor Anderson-Rubin statistic, um, where now the subfactor Anderson-Rubin statistic is expressed as the smallest root of this characteristic polynomial here. So by, by these um, absolute value signs, I, I mean the determinant um, of, of this uh, equation here, uh, of this matrix here, sorry. So by kappa i hat, we mean the roots of the characteristic polynomial ordered non-increasingly. So we have um, p many um, such roots, where p is now defined as mw plus one, and the Anderson-Rubin statistic is simply the smallest one, kp hat of these uh, character um, of these of these roots. Okay, again, going from here to here is a very simple exercise, just exploiting the uh, one potential uh, definition of the minimal eigenvalue. That is what kappa min of a matrix represents. Um, so it's a very simple um, mathematical tra transition going from here to here. What is the advantage of working with this representation of the Anderson Rubin subfactor statistic rather than this one? Well, here uh, you can multiply from left and right with any non-singular matrix and the, the roots are um, unchanged. So here I already um, give a representation of the Anderson-Rubin subfactor statistic where I pre and post multiply by these matrices and the advantage of uh, the, the, this representation is that we get a uh, distributional representation that is very, very um, 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 positive for our purposes. What, what I'm trying to do um, at this stage is to reduce the, um, I, I wanna see uh, a representation of the Anderson-Rubin statistic that allows me um, where, where the distributional, where, where the distribution of the subfactor Anderson-Rubin statistic is represented with a very low dimensional nuisance parameter. So as of now, we have the reduced form coefficient matrices, right? The, the pi y and the pi w as nuisance parameters and also the gamma. So our nuisance parameters at this stage are pi y and pi w and the gamma. And my objective at this point is to reduce the dimensionality to something very low dimensional so that I can really see what the distribution of the subfactor Anderson Rubin statistic depends on. So representing the Anderson Rubin statistic in this particular way um, goes a long way on, on that road, route, namely, um, given the distributional assumptions we made, namely the normality assumption on the reduced form errors, these objects here are distributed as multivariate normal with uh, a non-central, with, with a non-zero mean. Okay, that's why I needed um, this transformation on the left and on the right. Now, these objects here are simply normally distributed. So what has been shown so far is that the subvector Anderson Rubin statistic is the smallest root of this uh, determinantal equation here, where the psi is normally distributed with an unknown mean vector, a uh, mean matrix M, and a variance covariance matrix that is actually known. It's uh, the identity matrix. So I've already reduced by this particular representation of the Anderson Rubin statistic the nuisance parameters to just this matrix M here that is now K by P. Okay, and furthermore, we can say more under the, the, the null hypothesis, the non-centrality uh, matrix is actually known to be rank deficient. M is equal to zero, uh, a column of uh, zeros uh, times a, um, this theta matrix. We, we don't have to understand exactly what theta is. Importantly, it just measures the strengths of uh, identification for gamma. Okay. So why is M rank deficient here? That's very easily seen. So going back to the determinantal, um, uh, to, the, to the characteristic polynomial. So under the null hypothesis, beta naught is the true parameter, right? So Y minus Y beta naught 
is nothing else but W gamma plus epsilon. So Y zero upper bar is nothing else but W gamma plus epsilon. Okay, so let's see that W gamma plus epsilon. Okay, so epsilon has zero mean, which means that in expectation, this matrix here consists of um, expectation of W, and then here we have expectation of W gamma. So the first column is simply a linear combination of the remaining columns, which, which then implies that the, um, that the mean matrix M here um, is ranked efficient. Okay, the first column is a linear combination of the remaining columns, so we can write M in this particular way. So we have further reduced by that insight the dimensionality of the nuisance parameter matrix because we know that M consists of one column of zeros. So the only remaining um, nuisance parameter is now um, this uh, theta matrix. We can do better than that. Okay, here I'm summarizing again what I just said. The anderson rubin statistic is the minimum eigenvalue of a non-central Wishart matrix, because um, after all, if uh, uh, Xi here uh, is normally distributed, then Xi prime Xi is a Wishart matrix, right? By, by definition of a Wishart, uh, distribution. So we, we know that um, anderson rubin statistic is the minimum eigenvalue of a non-central Wishart matrix. Under the more, more precisely, under the null hypothesis, the P by P matrix, this Wishart matrix, has a non-central uh, Wishart with non-centrality uh, matrix M prime M that has certain zeros here. Okay, so the, the only nuisance parameters remaining um, are therefore um, the, the components um, of this matrix here. Furthermore, we know that the distribution of the eigenvalues and, and the Anders Rubin subfactor statistic is one of the eigenvalues of a non central Wishart matrix only depends on the eigenvalues of the non centrality matrix M prime M. So rather than being concerned now of this entire nuisance parameter um, matrix, we only have to be concerned about the eigenvalues of that matrix. Okay, so we only have to be concerned about the eigenvalues, which further reduces the dimensionality of the nuisance parameters. Okay, so the, the distribution of the kappa i hats only depends on the eigenvalues of that matrix. So by this particular representation, we have achieved um, insight into uh, the, the nuisance parameters that really, um, that, that, the, that the distribution of the subfactor Anderson Rubin statistic really depends on. In particular, when MW is equal to one, when the dimensionality of gamma is equal to one, there's only a uh, um, um, scalar nuisance parameter, namely kappa, the, an object that we define as kappa i. That is um, be, be, because in that case, this matrix is scalar. So when MW is equal to one, um, there's a scalar um, nuisance parameter that uh, influences the uh, this null distribution of the anderson rubin subvector statistic, and it measures the strengths or weakness of identification of gamma. So in this context, now we have a one-dimensional nuisance parameter, which should make it very easy to gain insight into what nuisance parameter, uh, what, what critical value we should use in conjunction with the subvector anderson rubin statistic. Um, here's a theorem uh, that dates back to Perlman and Olkin in 1980. We have worked on that for a very long time and we got close to reproducing that result when we stumbled off on, over that paper in 1980. So we, we could have uh, saved a lot of effort and work if we had read the um, literature in, in statistics from, from dating back 40 years ago. So when MW is equal to one, it turns out that under the null hypothesis, the distribution function of the subvector anderson rubin statistic is monotonically decreasing in the parameter kappa one. So what this is saying is that in terms of quantiles of the subvector anderson rubin statistic, the largest quantile occurs when identification for gamma is strongest. Again, kappa one measures the strength or weakness of identification for gamma. As kappa one increases, the quantiles of the subvector anderson rubin statistic become larger. So um, in, in terms of implementing the subvector Anderson Rubin um, statistic, uh, the, the subvector Anderson Rubin uh, test together with the subvector Anderson Rubin statistic, you, you are safe by using 
the uh, chi-squared critical values with k minus mw degrees of freedom. That's what we found in our 2012 paper. But here we find that there's actually um, a monotonic ranking. The stronger the identification is, um, the, the larger the one minus alpha quantile of the subvector and this movement statistic becomes. So here we plotted uh, the CDFs of the subvector Anderson Rubin statistic with a particular number of instruments for different values of identification for gamma. And we see that the larger kappa one becomes, the lower the CDF is, which means that the one minus alpha quantile of the subvector Anderson Rubin statistic becomes larger and larger as kappa one increases. So this now, or back then, um, yielded uh, an opportunity maybe to come up with more powerful subvector Anderson Rubin tests, namely by exploiting this ranking here. If we knew the strengths or weakness of identification of gamma, if we knew what kappa one was, we could implement the test with a smaller critical value, namely the one minus alpha quantile of the CD uh, of, of the uh, distribution of the Anderson subvector Anderson Rubin statistic, because it only depends on kappa one. Once you give me kappa one. I know the entire distribution of the subvector in this movement statistic. So if we knew kappa one, we could implement it um, in, in a more powerful way than just using the, the chi-squared critical value. That is the critical value when kappa one is infinity. Okay, so in 2019, we were at that crossroad here. Um, if we knew kappa one, we could implement the subvector in this movement test with a smaller critical value than the one that was suggested previously, which is the one we know we need when uh, identification of gamma is strong. But unfortunately, of course, we don't know kappa one. So what would be the next best thing to do? We could try to find a sufficient statistic for kappa one and then do conditional inference. Unfortunately, there is no known sufficient statistic for kappa one. But again, looking at the statistic little, statistical literatures, uh, literature from 40 years ago, we found the following result in Moorhead 78. Under the null hypothesis, when kappa one is large, the larger root, okay, remember that in, in the case where MW is equal to two, we have two roots of the characteristic polynomial, kappa one hat and kappa two hat, where kappa two hat is the subvector Anderson Rubin statistic. Kappa one hat is a sufficient statistic for kappa one. So under strong identification, the idea that I just laid out, namely using conditional inference, conditioning on uh, kappa one hat, and then proceeding uh, with um, calculating the um, conditional uh, the conditional quantile of the subvector Anderson Rubin statistic, conditional on uh, kappa one hat taken on a particular value, that would lead to a test that controls the null rejection probability when kappa one is large. However, it doesn't guarantee that that would yield um, uh, subvector inference that controls the null rejection probability when kappa one is small. Okay, but we just thought that that may be an interesting avenue to consider and just try to see what happens. We are conditioning on kappa one hat. And given that there's only a uh, scalar nuisance parameter, namely kappa one, we can find by simulation whether um, the null rejection probability is controlled using a fine grid of kappa one values and just by simulation verifying that the null rejection probability is controlled. So this is the avenue that we pursued in our 2019 paper. So first of all, what does it mean that um, when kappa one is large, that kappa one hat is a sufficient statistic for kappa one? So it means the following. Um, the conditional density of the Anderson Rubin statistic, which is kappa two hat, given kappa one hat can be approximated as follows. So here on the left hand side, we have the density, the conditional density um, of kappa two hat given kappa one hat. That is a density that depends on kappa one. It can be approximated by an object, by um, an object that does not depend on kappa one. So here, this is the density of a chi squared distribution with k k minus one degrees of freedom. Then we have this object that doesn't depend on, on kappa one. And we have this function G. Um, it, it's a um, complicated object. I'll explain what it is on the, on, on the next slide. Importantly here, the right-hand side is, is something that does not depend on kappa one. So it's completely nuisance parameter free. And we can simulate from that density. The wiggle sign means that if you divide the left-hand side by the right-hand side, 
it goes to one as kappa one goes off to infinity. So this is what it means that under the null hypothesis, when, when kappa one is large, kappa one going to infinity, um, the, the, the larger wood is a, um, a sufficient statistic for kappa one. So it, it means that the dividing the left-hand side by the right-hand side, uh, the, this quotient goes to one as kappa one goes off to infinity. So we have the right-hand side here being nuisance parameter three. Okay, again, G is, is something um, given to us. It, it has a very complicated structure. Um, it, it involves confluent hypergeometric function, but it, in theory, it is known to us. So from this representation or from this result in Moore 1978, we thought, okay, let's try what happens when we condition when we do conditional inference conditional on kappa one hat we we know that under strong identification when kappa one is very very large that procedure will control the null rejection probability but as a priori we didn't know what would happen under weak identification but we knew that we could check very easily because we only have a scalar nuisance parameter kappa one uh, we 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 knew that we could check very easily whether or not there is an over rejection under the null hypothesis when identification is weak so in short, again, we propose to use as a new critical value for the subvector and Anders-Rubin test, the one minus alpha quantile of the approximation of the uh, Anders-Rubin uh, statistic given kappa one hat. So we are simulating critical values, one minus alpha quantiles from this approximation here, from that density. Okay, so denote this critical value, this conditional critical value by C1 minus alpha. It depends on the uh, conditioning statistic, and it also depends on the degree of over identification, K minus MW. And obviously, it also depends on the nominal size alpha. So the conditional quantiles can be compu computed by numerical integration, right? We have a density, we can compute the one minus alpha quantiles. Uh, the conditional critical values can be tabulated, and we, do, we did so in our 2019 paper. That makes for a very easy, for applied researchers, implementation of the new test, because both the test statistic, the subvector and the Rubin statistic, and also the critical values are given to the applied researcher. Uh, it turns out that, the, as I discussed, that the um, critical values are increasing in the condition, conditioning statistic kappa one hat, and they are converging to the critical values that, that we used in our 2012 paper. And then, so uh, the, the procedure, uh, our, our um, research project could have stopped right here if we had found that with these critical values, we get over rejection under the null when identification is weak. But it turns out that using these critical values, the size is actually controlled. So over a very fine print of kappa one values, we simulated what the null rejection probability is of that new test. And it turns out that the test is uh, <clears throat> controls the size. And given that the critical values are increasing um, and, and approaching the critical values that we used in our 2012 paper, it turns out that the test has better power properties than in our 2012 paper, because we are always using critical values that are strictly smaller than the ones that were suggested uh, in the 2012 paper. So in summary, um, suppose that MW is equal to one, then the new conditional subvector anderson rubin test that I just introduced or discussed has correct size under the assumptions above, under these very strong distributional assumptions, right? Uh, normality for the structural error term, the Zs, the IVs being non-random. Um, we, have, we have that theorem. So I should make clear again that the proof is partly based on simulations. We are simulating over a one-dimensional nuisance parameters and we verified the theorem for various nominal sizes and for various degrees of over identification. Okay, so when MW is equal to one, the conditional test that rejects when the subvector vector Anderson-Rubin test statistic exceeds this new conditional critical value um, has size um, um, alpha um, and is strictly more powerful than our uh, previous suggestion, which was to use um, chi-squared critical values. So we have a test now that uh, adapts to the strengths or weakness of identification of gamma, but so far I've discussed it only when MW is equal to one. The uh, generalization, oh, let, let, me, let me show you 
uh, first, uh, <clears throat> how the critical values become smaller when identification is weak relative to our 2012 paper. So here I have four charts for various numbers of instruments, k equal 2, 5, 10, and uh, 20. I'm plotting for um, alpha equal to 5%, the chi-squared critical values with one minus uh, alpha degree, uh, with um, k, uh, k minus one degrees of freedom uh, for, for this particular nominal size alpha. So they are plotted here. They don't depend on kappa one hat, obviously, right? These are the chi-squared critical values. And I'm plotting the new conditional critical value that we suggest in our 2019 paper. They depend on kappa one hat on the conditioning statistic. And you can see that when, <coughs> when identification is weak, that the new critical value is much, much smaller than the previously suggested critical values. They are increasing in the degree of, uh, in the strength or weakness of identification and the asymptote to the chi-squared critical values when identification is very strong. So there are power gains to be expected relative to the 2012 paper, namely when identification is weak. Then in the paper we have, in the 2019 paper, we have these uh, tables of critical values. So here for, for various nominal sizes and degrees of over-identification, we are telling what the critical value is as a function of the conditioning statistic. So if the applied researcher finds that the conditioning statistic uh, kappa one hat is 2.94, the applied researcher should use as the critical value 2.6. Okay, that makes uh, implementation of the test immediate and, and fast. And here to give you some idea about the null rejection probability, which immediately has spillover effects on power as well. Um, here we are plotting the null rejection frequency of the subvector Anderson-Rubin uh, test when used uh, with the conditional, the new critical values and the previous chi-squared critical values. So you can see that under the null, uh, null hypothesis, the um, um, test statistic together with the fixed chi-squared critical values severely under-rejects sometimes under the null hypothesis when identification is weak. Whereas our test while still under-rejecting is much closer to being similar. Okay, so we are lifting up the, uh, the uh, rejection probabilities under the null and making them closer to the 5% level, which then obviously also has spillover effects on, on power. Okay, so what to do when MW is, is, is bigger than one? Now, when MW is bigger than one, then this matrix here, um, Xi prime Xi is now of dimension um, 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 MW by MW, uh, sorry, P by P, where P is MW plus one. So we have more um, eigenvalues in, in, that, in that matrix than before. Previously, when MW was equal to one, this was a two by two matrix, and we picked the larger eigenvalue as the conditioning statistic. So this time the question is what, what, what to do? How should we um, um, define the conditional, critical uh, the con uh, conditional critical value when MW is bigger than one? What we are using is the largest eigenvalue of that Wishart matrix, which in the case where MW is equal to one boils down to what we used in uh, previously. Okay, if, if you only have two eigenvalues, using the larger uh, eigenvalue, again, means that we are using the largest eigenvalue actually. So it can then be shown that if you uh, implement the test in this, particular form, in, in this particular way, that the test again has correct size, and it can also be shown again that it has uniformly larger power than the test that we suggested in our 2012 paper. Um, here, maybe one could do better um, rather than using the, the largest eigenvalue using something um, smaller would yield a test with, uh, that, that is more powerful, but we didn't manage to establish that uh, then the test would also control the size. So that is the best we could do in our 2019 paper. Okay, so everything so far was finite sample. Now we are dropping all these restrictive finite sample assumptions, the normality assumption, the assumption that the IVs were non-random. And we're looking at this um, parameter space now, F HOM, where HOM uh, index, indexes homoscedasticity. So it looks very, very complicated, but what you should take away from, from, from this complicated looking parameter space is the following. First of all, we are imposing in, in this line here, that the IVs are really IVs. That means that they are uncorrelated with um, 
the uh, the error terms. Okay. Secondly, we are we have to impose certain uniform moment bounds on on certain random vectors, because this time we have to imp uh, we have to uh, get certain central limit theorems, uh, the upper of central limit theorems, to work. So we need these uh, uniform moment bounds here. And thirdly, the only other thing you should uh, see here is that we impose that a certain um, variance covariance matrix factors into a Kronecker product. Okay, so this is a slightly weaker, less restrictive assumption than imposing conditional homoscedasticity. So conditional homoscedasticity would mean <clears throat> that the variance covariance matrix, the conditional variance covariance matrix of UI, where UI is this vector here, does not depend on ZI. Having this factorization here by the law of iterated expectation is slightly weaker than condition, uh, conditional homoscedasticity. So here UI again features this object, which is YI minus YI bar beta naught. Okay, Th that's a different way to rewrite uh, what, what YI bar is. Okay, so we have to impose restrictions on, 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 on this random vector that consists of what you get from the left-hand side if you subtract out um, Y, y i uh, y i beta naught. <clears throat> so the parameter space here is much less restrictive than in the finite sample context. We don't impose any distributional assumption, any explicit distributional assumptions. We don't impose normality anymore. We have to impose certain uniform moment bounds here. So two plus uh, delta moments have to be uniformly bounded. Uh, the IVs have to be IVs and uh, which is key for what we do in our current paper. Uh, at, at this point, we still have to impose um, conditional homoscedasticity or slightly weaker version of that. So what do we do in our 2019 paper in this under, under this setup? Um, we define the subfactor Anderson Rubin statistic again as the smallest solution to this characteristic uh, uh, polynomial here, a polynomial equation. Um, it looks exactly like the definition of the subfactor Anderson Rubin statistic before with the modification that the matrix that was that was previously assumed to be known, this omega beta naught matrix, is now replaced by a consistently estimated counterpart. So <clears throat> the, this equation is just like in the finite sample case where we replace um, omega beta naught by, by this matrix that turns out to be a consistent estimator of that matrix. So that's it. And from, from that point onward, we proceed exactly analogously to the finite sample case. So we define the subfactor in this Rubin statistic as the smallest solution to this characteristic equation. And the critical value is defined also analogously to before, where we evaluate the same, uh, the, the same functional form, but we evaluate it at kappa one hat. That is now the largest uh, solution to this characteristic um, equation. So there's some slight abuse of notation, right? I'm using the same notation <clears throat> here in, 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 in this context that I used in the finite sample context, even though the roots are now different because I'm replacing omega beta naught by, by this matrix. Okay, so the definition of the, the, the test statistic um, was very easy um, following the finite sample case. Um, the, the proof of the theorem is, is a bit harder. So we, we can show that the new subfactor in this Rubin test has correct asymptotic size for, for this parameter space F home. Okay, so meaning that the limb sub of the worst null rejection probability is bounded by alpha. The proof is based on <clears throat> papers that I have with Don Andrews. Uh, so to, to show that the, the asymptotic size of the test is controlled, it turns out that, that it is enough to show that the asymptotic null rejection probability of a test is controlled along certain um, drifting sequences of parameters and, and results of that type um, are borrowed um, from uh, this paper, Andrews Cheng and Guckenberger 2020. So, <clears throat> so we, we show that along these uh, drifting sequences of parameters, um, we end up asymptotically with um, um, situations that were encountered in the finite sample case, and then we use the finite sample result. By doing so, the proof relies on the corresponding finite sample result, which was partly based on simulations, 
So the disclaimer that followed after the previous theorem, namely that part of the proof is based on simulations, also applies to this theorem here. Okay, so we where we stand right now, we have a subvector Anderson-Rubin test that is uh, controlling the asymptotic size for this parameter space here, for this parameter space f hom that in particular imposes this factorization of a certain variance covariance matrix. So the idea could now be that um, we are now that we want to move on to dropping this assumption. Okay, we want to have uh, we don't want to have any conditional homoscedasticity restriction in our parameter space. The idea could now be that we first implement a pretest <coughs> and, and check whether the data is compatible um, um, with conditional homoscedasticity, in which case we could implement our procedure. And if the pretest deems that the procedure, uh, that the data are not compatible with conditional homoscedasticity, we use the procedure in Andrews 2017. That is a, a reasonable procedure to pursue un, uh, with, the, with, with, a, with one prob, uh, problem, namely that likely the pretest <clears throat> that checks for conditional homoscedasticity would always reject the null hypothesis. Because in our experience, most empirical data sets are not compatible with conditional homoscedasticity. Um, so what, what therefore we're gonna pursue is to come up with a uh, subject Anderson Rubin test that is compatible with a larger um, parameter space that does not um, impose conditional homoscedasticity, but something a little bit weaker, namely chronic product structure um, a, um, a, a general chronic product structure for the variance covariance matrix. So for example, if you imposed, um, if you were to impose conditional homoscedasticity in a wage regression, and one of the exogenous regressors was race, then the conditional homoscedasticity assumption would mean that the variance of wages must not depend on race. And we, we if, you, if you look at uh, data, wage data from, um, um, from the US, for example, it turns out that uh, race uh, impacts the uh, variance of wages dramatically. Uh, in, in the United States, for example, the um, largest um, variance of wages is for the Asian um, population, okay? Whereas Blacks, for example, have smaller variance of wages. So imposing that restriction would be incompatible with data. And you would always, using the two-stage procedure, you would then always end up using the Andrews 2017 procedure and the procedure would not yield anything new. So we wanna uh, use that idea, but for uh, where we interject an intermediate step, we enlarge the parameter space. So we call this uh, parameter space uh, KP, FKP, where KP stands for chronic product. So rather than working with uh, a parameter space that imposes conditional homoscedasticity, we now allow for this parameter space that, that replaces the particular chronic product structure that we had before, namely this one, where the um, variance, <coughs> where, where this matrix here factors into this particular chronic product structure, we now um, only impose that the variance matrix factors into this general chronic product structure. Okay, so where G1 and G2 are uh, some positive definite matrices, where we normalize the upper left element uh, element of G1 to be equal to one. So I, I will show in a second that this um, um, nests conditional homoscedasticity, obviously, because you can pick G1 and G2 as was the, defined in, in F hom, but it also nests several interesting cases of conditional heteroscedasticity. And then ultimately we wanna pursue the following idea. Am I already over time? Um, it's already 8.10, right? I'm already <laughs> over time. It's quite but, 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 but you told me I can go until 8.30, right? Okay, so, okay. <clears throat> so, okay. So this covers conditional homoscedasticity, but also cases of conditional heteroscedasticity. And then we want to pursue, we, we first uh, generalize our conditional subvector in this Rubin test to this parameter space. And then to get rid of any assumption or restriction about conditional heteroscedasticity, we will implement a two-stage procedure where we first test for chronic product structure. And then if the test rejects, we're gonna pursue with uh, the Andrews 2017 test. Otherwise we use our more powerful test. 
And we show in our uh, companion paper, the one in Journal of Econometrics that I alluded to earlier, that this restriction here is compatible with um, a substantive amount or a substantive number of empirical papers. We went through um, 120 specifications of recently published papers and at a 5% nominal size, we could not reject, um, we could not reject this, this null hypothesis. Okay, so let, let's pro proceed by first um, motivating that the general chronic product structure um, <clears throat> nests conditional homoscedasticity, but also cer certain um, um, cases of conditional heteroscedasticity. Here's one example. So start off with a vector epsilon i tilde vw tilde, uh, that is zero mean with positive definite variance matrix and independent of zi and then define the structural and the reduced form error to be a uh, scalar multiple of, of this previously defined matrix here, uh, vector here. So f zi could be, for example, this object here. So then it is very easily shown that um, un under this specification, we have general chronic product structure. So here the expectation of that matrix that's just matrix algebra. We, we can rewrite it like this. To go from here to here, we replace what UI is. Okay, UI is this object. Okay, so we simply plug in what UI is. And now going from here to here, we replace epsilon i and VW, uh, VW by, by this definition here. Okay, so we plug that in. Given that <clears throat> ZI is independent of the tilde expressions, we can then factor the expectation, or we can write this expectation as a product of, of, of two expectations, given the independence between zi and the tilde expressions. So we have that this matrix here factors into a uh, chronic product, okay? But uh, conditional homoscedasticity is violated because the uh, conditional expectation of ui, ui prime condition on zi depends on zi. So we have shown that general chronic product structure, structure um, structure um, nests conditional homoscedasticity, obviously, but also features certain uh, cases of conditional heteroscedasticity or allows for certain um, cases of conditional heteroscedasticity. So, okay, let me try to be a little quicker. So, how do we modify our subvector NS Rubin test uh, to the more uh, to the bigger parameter space um, FKP rather than FHOM? So we first um, estimate the, um, the factors in the chronic product structure representation. We can simply um, estimate RF, this matrix here, by uh, the sample analog. So we have a consistent estimator RN hat for RF. And once you have uh, an, a consistent estimator, we just do brute force. So we are trying to fit the best chronic product um, to, to this matrix R in head. And we do this by minimizing this Frobenius norm here over all um, positive definite matrices G1 bar, G2 bar, uh, G, G2 bar uh, being positive definite symmetric matrices where we normalize the upper left element of G1 bar to be equal to one. Now, this seems like a super complicated problem, right? You are minimizing a Frobenius norm over positive definite symmetric matrices. It sounds like it's a problem that you can never get your hands on you know, computationally, but it turns out that this is actually um, a rather trivial problem. The uh, G1 uh, hat and G2 hat are actually given in closed form. Okay, I, I specify the, or we, we specify obviously the, the estimators in the, in the paper, they are given in closed form. They are unique and given in closed form. So there is no comp computational effort in obtaining these estimators. And then the definition of the subfactor factor Rubin statistic and the critical value straightforward. We again define them from a characteristic polynomial equation where we now replace what was previously this object by G1 hat and what was previously this object by G2 hat. So again, with slight abuse of notation, uh, the Anderson-Rubin statistic is given uh, by uh, kappa p hat, okay, the smallest root of that cap characteristic polynomial mm -hmm. uh, equation, and the, the critical value analogously defined using the largest um, uh, root of the characteristic polynomial. And then we show again that the resulting um, test procedure has correct, correct, um, as it has correct asymptotic size. And we can even show that uh, the theorem continues to hold under approximate chronic product structure, 
where rather than this matrix having exact Kronecker product structure, uh, we allow for some uh, disturbance here uh, of a matrix uh, Xi n that goes goes to zero as, as n goes to infinity. Okay, so we, we have now a procedure that controls the asymptotic size under approximate chronic product structure. And now we implement that idea um, of a two-stage procedure in, in, the, in, in the case where we drop any restriction on the variance covariance matrix. We first will test whether the variance covariance matrix RF is compatible with chronic product structure. If yes, we continue with the procedure that I just defined. If not, we use the Andrews 2017 procedure. So this is uh, what we do in our current paper. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I just mentioned all that. So how do we implement this? So we, we have to, um, right, we have to first check whether the data are compatible with chronic product structure. So we compare Rn hat, the estimator for the variance covariance matrix, with the best chronic product structure approximation. These are the objects that I defined on the previous slide. And uh, kappa n hat, the essentially the Frobenius uh, norm difference between those two objects, normalized by n to the one half, we use that object kappa one kappa n hat as our pretest, so to speak, to check whether the data are compatible with chronic product structure. So there's a um, user chosen constant Cn. Um, if kappa n hat is bigger than Cn, then we proceed with the robust procedure, say with the Andrews 2017 procedure. Otherwise, we use our test procedure that I uh, previously defined, the one that works only under chronic product structure. So there is a user chosen constant. Um, for those of you who are in, uh, familiar with the moment inequality literature, that looks very, uh, very much akin to the procedure that Andrews and Soares um, introduced in, in, in the Econometrica 2010 paper to check whether, <clears throat> whether a certain moment inequalities are binding or not. So I'll, if, if I have uh, five minutes uh, at the end, I'll uh, describe how CN is chosen by us. We have, we have a procedure um, um, to, um, to suggest what CN should be chosen in a particular context. But first getting the theory uh, right, so whenever you do a pretest, there is a danger, of course, that you screw up the asymptotic size of the two-stage procedure. Um, so the first objective is to implement this test in a way to make sure that the um, asymptotic size is controlled. So we assume that the robust test is a test that satisfies these two key restrictions that we then uh, verify uh, for the particular choices uh, of robust that we, we are using. So robust has to be a test that um, has correct asymptotic size for the parameter space f hat, where f hat is the parameter space that drops any restriction on the variance covariance matrix. So it doesn't impose uh, chronic product structure or conditional homoscedasticity or any restriction of that sort. And then we have to assume that the robust procedure is such that the probability of phi robust being small or equal to phi uh, chronic product goes to one under um, approximate chronic product structure sequences. So these are drifting DGPs that get um, closer and closer to a chronic product structure as the sample size increases. So these are um, two uh, assumptions, as I mentioned, that we verify in, in our paper for, for, particular for a particular choice of phi robust. So under these two restrictions, it is relatively easy to show that the resulting test, let's call it phi CN, it depends on that, uh, sequence of um, user chosen constants has correct asymptotic size. And here's the reason. I'm almost done. That's the second to last slide. So we are using again this, um, this insight that to show correct asymptotic size, it is enough to show lim a correct limiting null rejection probability under particular drifting parameter sequences. And the sequences that matter here are sequences that are far from chronic product structure in the sense that the statistic k and hat. Um, goes off to infinity, okay, when, um, um, and under such sequences, sorry, I, I, I misspoke, not k, uh, k and head going to, to infinity, but uh, this object here where we evaluate at uh, population quantities. So th th this is what we call far from chronic product structure, where the difference between the actual variance covariance matrix and its best uh, chronic product structure approximation goes off to infinity when blown up to the uh, by by n to the one half. 
Under such sequences, one can show that with probability approaching one, our pretest procedure will detect that we are far off from chronic product structure. That means we'll re resort to the robust procedure with probability approaching one as n goes to infinity. And we know by assumption that phi rob has correct limiting null rejection probability. So under such sequences, we are controlling the null rejection probability asymptotically. And under sequences that are approximate chronic product structure, sequences in the sense that this object here is big O1, uh, we sh showed before that our test, the KP test, has limiting null rejection probability bounded by alpha. And given the second assumption that we made um, on, on the previous slide here, we then know that also um, the overall test has to control the uh, limiting null rejection probability because phi rob, after all, uh, will never reject when, uh, um, when phi kp doesn't reject. Okay, so also under these uh, drifting sequences of parameters, the limiting null rejection probability is controlled. Okay, and uh, under the above assumption, the new test that we introduced has non-smaller rejection probabilities than the robust procedure, implying that the test has better power properties than the robust procedure. And we, we show that in our simulations that we actually uniformly dominate in terms of power. Okay, just one um, last, um, so I already mentioned that for the robust test, we take the, a particular implementation of, the, uh, of, of a test in, in Andrews 2017. Uh, so the last item I wanna quickly discuss is this slide here. How do we pick CN? How do we pick this user chosen constant uh, CN in a particular implementation of uh, our procedure? So we did extensive uh, Monte Carlo simulations where we determine good choices for CN. So CN uh, are allowed to depend on K, on the number of IVs. And we take this particular um, formula for CN. So we take it as a some constant CK that is being picked from, from this set here, together with N to the one half divided by log log N. So this is picked in a way that if you uh, divide by N to the one half, um, then the uh, critical value will go, um, um, will go to zero, right? And um, let's see. Um, so the restrictions we need for Cn are such that Cn goes off to infinity. And if you divide by n to the one half, it goes to zero. So I already discussed the, the last part. We implement um, the user chosen constant in a way that this is guaranteed. If you divide by n to the one half, then the critical value will go to zero. But without normalization, the CN will go off to infinity, obviously, because N to one half goes to infinity much quicker than LN, 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 N. OK, so what we do is um, we randomly generate thousands of DGP, and we determine in these simulations the largest CK from that set for which the simulated size of the test is never larger than 6% for 5% nominal size. So we are guaranteeing in, um, by, by, by that procedure that the over rejection in finite samples is rather small. We cannot uh, do this by saying we want 5% uh, for 5% nominal size because also the robust procedure sometimes over rejects in finite samples. Okay, so last slide, um, this is how we pick the CK. And with this particular implementation, we now do Monte Carlo simulations where we compare our procedure to the uh, robust procedure suggested in Andrews uh, 2017 that we use for implementation of our test and also other versions that Andrews 2017 suggested. It turns out uh, that our procedure is very competitive, especially in uh, situations where we have small degrees of over-identification when K is rather small, when the IVs are very, very weak um, or where we have mixed strengths of identification where beta may be strongly identified and gamma weakly identified and vice versa. On the other hand, uh, this procedure, the procedure by Andrews, uh, based on power considerations, is to be preferred when, we, when, when K is very, very large, when we have over-identification, um, large degrees of over-identification, then typically um, Andrews procedure, the particular AR QLR1 test that does better in terms of power, but it is computationally harder to implement than our procedure. Okay, so given that I'm uh, far over time, I think I'm gonna stop here um, and, uh, 
uh, don't go through uh, many slides showing you exactly how the procedures compare in terms of power. Is there any questions? Yes. Hi. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, so, how does this work when k is larger, and also when uh, when z's are uh, slightly invalid? So K being larger, so uh, the Andrews procedure, this particular procedure by Andrews tends to do better than our procedure when K is large. And that comes brings me back to the issue of how we define the, um, let me try to find that slide. So how do we define our test when MW is bigger than one? Right, I discussed here, I, I'll get there eventually. So when MW is bigger than one, we have a choice a priori of how to pick the uh, conditional um, conditioning statistic here. And we work with the largest eigenvalue of that Wishart matrix. And that turns out to be a choice that allows us to show correct asymptotic, uh, to, to, to show us correct size. But in terms of this power- is, This is kappa, it, this is kappa, right? What what is kappa? Uh, you're talking about kappa. Yes. So I'm talking about k. Yes. Number of but, 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 exactly, but that, that is related. So m m m w. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, you are talking about kappa. Yes. Okay. So I, I was thinking about uh, over identification. I, I I made a point why in. Uh, right. Um, so what uh, I don't. Uh, so I have an, an explanation as to why one would assume that uh, Dawn's procedure does better in, in situations where gamma is of uh, high dimension. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of, well, it, it probably the, the argument could be made um, just from the full vector procedure as well. We know that the Anderson-Rubin procedure is not a good procedure in over-identified situations. And mm -hmm. that spills down to, or spills over to our sub-vector procedure, given that it uh, is built from the Anderson-Rubin statistic in over-identified situations, we, we, we have uh, uh, worse power than procedures that are based on the conditional likelihood ratio test uh, of uh, Moraira and, and Kleibergen, which is a procedure that uh, Andrews uh, uses in, 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 in his implementation. So, so the, we know that the Anderson-Rubin uh, uh, test not only tests the hypothesis of interest, but it also tests validity of the IVs, right? Yeah. And, and so they are negative, um, th that has negative implications on power in situations where K is large. Yeah. So, and, and then your second question about C? Well, the in, in, invalid, slightly in, invalid instruments. Ah, okay. So I, I don't have any insight on that. We didn't do the simulations. Yeah. I, so the, um, I, I have a paper uh, where I compare robust uh, in 2012 in ET I look at uh, slightly invalid instruments, so where the Zs could be correlated slightly with the endogenous regressors. And mm -hmm. in that context, I show that in terms of size distortion, Anderson-Rubin test was actually the best. So it, it beats the Lagrange multiplier and the conditional likelihood ratio test. So if spillover happens also, uh, uh, would happen again, um, then that would suggest that our procedure is probably more robust to um, slightly invalid IVs. Thanks. Any other questions? Patrick, so essentially all results for normals can be generalized to the case of uh, moment assumptions, second yes. moment. Yeah, yeah. So, so all we need, um, as I said, the, uh, the asymptotic size results are always derived under um, by, by showing that the limiting null rejection probability is controlled under drifting sequences of parameters. And when you have these drifting sequences of parameters and you, uh, under these drifting sequences of parameters, we need valid uh, central limit theorems. And we use uh, Lyapunov type central limit theorems, but in order to, uh, for validity of those, we need uh, a certain number of moments being uh, uniformly bounded. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Now, how, how, so just to get a feel of how restrictive that Kronika's structure is. Yeah. Uh, so we, the, the best uh, case we, or the, like a um, primitive, so to speak, um, So a primitive setup would be really this one here. Um, and, and that's the best we could come up with, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, so we, you, you start off with uh, IID, zero mean uh, random vector, and then you pre-multiply it by a scalar function of the IVs to get the structural error and the reduced form error. So, so as I showed here, it, it nests uh, cases of conditional heteroscedasticity, but then discussing uh, the particular example, the, the weight regression that I uh, discussed before, where I said homoscedasticity is too strong an assumption because it doesn't allow for the variance of wages to, to, to change with, with uh, race or gender or whatever. Um, under this assumption, it could change with race and gender, but it must be that the variance of wage now allowed to change condition on values uh, of the IVs uh, must be such that <clears throat> the variances of all endogenous regressors need to be affected by the same multiplicative constant. So we have we have dependence now of variances. Um, uh, we, we can allow for uh, variances to depend on ZI, but it must be the same dependence for all the endogenous uh, variables through this particular um, F function. So it is um, still restrictive, but as I mentioned in our companion paper, we take uh, I think 120 specifications of recently published papers, and we apply a, a test of uh, chronic, a test for the null of chronic product structure. And in 30% of the cases, we did not reject the, the null hypothesis. Now you could object, of course, and say that it, this may be the case because the test is not very powerful. Right, um, not rejecting the null could mean that our test is, is not very good, but in, in power simulations, we find that our test has nice U-shaped uh, form. So, whereas on the other hand, I should uh, add, we virtually always reject conditional homoscedasticity. So using these, uh, I think 120 specifications, I think in 95 or 99% of the cases we rejected the null of conditional homoscedasticity at the 5% nominal size, but we did not reject in at least 30% of the cases, the null of chronic product structure. <clears throat> so this uh, interjecting the, this parameter space FKP and modifying our subvector Anderson Rubin test to work on, on that parameter space seems to be empirically relevant because then we can use our procedure for 30% of the, the parameter spaces. Uh, sorry, for 30% of the empirical application. Thanks. Any other questions? Patrick, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Thank you very much for having me and I look forward to seeing you in, in person soon. Um, yeah. It has been a See long time. But hopefully the conference for uh, June Park will will work out and will be an occasion for us to see each other. Thank you very right. much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.